My dad says you guys are full of crap. Are you troubled by strange noises in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of dread in your basement or attic? Have you or your family ever seen a spook, specter, or ghost? I've been waiting to say that on camera for many, many years, guys. I am a humongous Ghostbusters fan. Honestly, this is one of the first films that I watched as a child. I must have worn out my VHS copy many, many times over. So as you can tell, I was really, really hyped for Ghostbusters Afterlife. This is a film that was supposed to come out in 2020, but due to obvious reasons, it was pushed back. You know, mostly because we were in the middle of a pandemic, but it is finally here and I'm here to talk about it. I definitely have my thoughts and you know, I kind of wish that something strange would happen in my neighborhood because we live we live in a mostly quiet neighborhood here in Arizona. Although I did find some uh, bits of fake blood on the wall. I actually have no idea how it got there. It's kind of spooky. Um, I found fake blood in other places, but not on that wall. It's kind of weird. I guess that's the strangest thing that's happened to me since we moved into this house. Anyway, you're here for my review of Ghostbusters Afterlife. Welcome to yet another episode of Round the Clock Frights. I am Joshua Essenberg. Jason Reitman, the director of such modern features as Juno, Up in the Air, and the criminally underrated Thank You for Smoking, which is a very, very smart political satire, um, takes over from his director, father, Ivan Reitman, uh, the director of such 80s classics as Stripes, Ghostbusters, and its sequel, Ghostbusters 2. And, you know, I'm not gonna lie, guys, um, when I heard that Jason Reitman was gonna be making this film, a part of me was a little concerned because, you know, he's developed his own unique style that is very different, you know, from his father's. His father directed studio comedies, and Jason Reitman has focused more on smaller indie films, like films that are very character-driven, films that are much more, you know, down-to-earth and realistic, so... Hiring Jason Reitman to make a Ghostbusters sequel, it would be like if they got Wes Anderson to direct a big budget Marvel movie. I didn't know if this was entirely going to work, but then again, I knew that Ivan Reitman would most likely be on set, you know, as a uh, close supervisor. And from what I heard, Ivan Reitman was actually heavily involved with the making of this movie. And so, you know, it's a generational thing. It's a cool uh, passing of the baton. You know, uh, Ivan Reitman made Ghostbusters, one of the most beloved 80s films of all time. And now his son, Jason Reitman, who, by the way, made a pretty uh, funny cameo as a little boy in Ghostbusters 2, which I'm sure you saw at the beginning of this video. I played a little a clip, there, clip there for you guys. He actually called the Ghostbusters full of crap right to their faces. Jason, well, some gosh. people have trouble believing in the paranormal. No, he just says you guys are full of crap and that's why you went out of business. Another concern I had. Okay, so when I watched the trailer for this movie, it seemed like they were replicating a style that wasn't necessarily Ghostbusters. The original Ghostbusters is an adult comedy. It had characters chain smoking. It had a character getting a blowjob from a female ghost. It had a lot of dirty innuendos. I mean, Peter Venkman is a sexual predator in that movie. I mean, he brings Thorazine, Thorazine, a date rape drug on his first date with Sigourney Weaver. So it had some pretty dark elements in it. This film seemed to be another Stranger Things type nostalgia piece. You know, something that was going to pay homage to, you know, classic kids films from the 80s like Explorers, The Goonies, Stand By Me. And I kind of had a problem with that. If the original Ghostbusters was more National Lampoon, this one looked more Spielbergian. Kind of, you know, that whimsical Spielbergian style and I had a problem with that going in, and I will say this about Ghostbusters Afterlife. For the first half or so, I wasn't entirely on board with his style. It had another variation of the Losers Club, you know, which was made famous in Stephen King's It. You have the you have all these kid outcasts who come together, and they each have like their own personalities and quirks. And honestly, apart from the main girl played by McKenna Grace, who is very charismatic and likable in the film, by the way, I didn't care much for these kids. There's a side character named Podcast who lives up to his name. He has a podcast and he's supposed to be the quirky, you know, funny one of the group. And honestly, I found him pretty grating at times. You know, sometimes he would say a line that came off as forced and it was very similar to what, you know, some of Marvel's characters do. You know, they would insert a quick quip, you know, in the middle of a dramatic moment just to lighten the tension. And he got under my skin a little bit. Finn Wolfhard plays McKenna Grace's older brother. He's kind of a grease monkey, you know, he's the one who finds a Ghostbusters Ecto-1 vehicle and he uh, fixes it up. So, he, I mean, he was fine. 
he's fine in mostly everything that he's in, except for the turning. The turning was a piece of flaming dog shit. <laughs> uh, Paul Rudd is... Paul Rudd. He plays a summer school teacher named Mr. Gruberson, a man who thinks that he can do pretty much anything he wants, you know, teaching during the summer. He shows kids... Okay, I'll admit, this was actually kind of funny. He shows these kids VHS... <laughs> via... V v VHS tapes from the 80s, he shows them horror films like Cujo and Child's Play. Man, I I'll tell you this, if a teacher showed a classroom full of 4th and 5th graders Cujo, they would most likely get fired in a millisecond. Like, that would definitely not happen. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that the majority of the new characters were either fine or forgettable. You know, there's this one character that Finn Wolfhard has a crush on, and she doesn't leave very much of an impression. She's just kind of there, you know, to be another member of the group. Carrie Coon is actually pretty spunky in this film. She plays the mother of the two kids, and, you know, she has some nice sassy remarks. And here's the thing. I've, I've seen some critics complain about this movie. They're saying that it has too much fan service and that it doesn't take its audience's intelligence, you know, very seriously. It panders to them. And here's the thing, guys. I don't necessarily have a problem with fan service, as long as the new elements are interesting enough. And I think I've said this before, fan service is fine. You know, if a filmmaker, you know, loves the material enough and they want to insert things that they love, you know, from a classic movie franchise, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. This movie I thought did fan service pretty well. A lot of the reviews are going to talk about how there might be too much fan service in this movie, but I thought there was a pretty decent balance. There is one close up though that was a little desperate. It was a close-up inside the Ecto-1 vehicle when the character opens a glove box, and I'm not gonna say what's inside the glove box, but it did get, it did get a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a groan out of me. And for the first half of this movie, you know, it did have its own style. It had its own voice. In fact, some of the scenes felt like they were directed by, well, like an, an indie filmmaker. Someone like Jason Reitman or Richard Linklater. There's a scene where Finn Wolfhard drives up to the mountaintop you know, with some of his new friends, and you know, the shots of the vehicles just driving up the mountain, it felt like something out of a Richard Richard Linklater film. You know, you even have like the indie rock music playing in the background, so there were elements that I liked in the first half, and also, this movie does take itself more seriously than say the 2016 Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters did. A lot of people had a problem with the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan. I didn't despise it like so many other people on the internet did. I just thought that it was mediocre. This film, I think, will appeal more to Ghostbusters fans. I think they'll be more happy with it. When it does get to the big climax, which I won't spoil here, let's just say that certain characters do show up. I mean, they've kind of spoiled it in the trails already, but, you know, these, you know, appearances did make my audience, you know, very excited and happy. And the ending to this movie, oh my goodness, okay. So, if an ending to a movie is able to just leave you feeling emotionally devastated, then it's obviously doing something right, because the ending to this movie is incredibly touching. You know, let's just say that they do pay tribute to, you know, um, the Ghostbusters franchise as a whole, and I'm not going to say that it left me teary-eyed, but it did make me feel a bit emotional. I mean, it's impossible not to, especially if you're a fan of this franchise. The ending... It did make up for some of the more average moments in the film, which by the way, as I said, the first half does have its own style. The second half, especially when you get near the end, it kind of goes the Force Awakens route a little bit. It does repeat a lot of things that we've seen before in other Ghostbusters movies, and they kind of felt like cheap, cheap replicas, I'm not going to lie. Like, there's one sequence that is almost a shot-by-shot -shot remake of the 1984 Ghostbusters film. I'm not going to go into much more detail than that, but that did get a little bit irritating. You know, the fact that they weren't trying to be entirely original. I mean, some of the ghosts in this movie, I mean, there are some, there are a couple of cool ghost designs, but, you know, they're mostly pulled from the first 1984 Ghostbusters film, which is fine. I know what they're trying to do. You know, they're trying to wrap things up in a neat narrative bowl. They're trying to, you know, tie it all back to the first Ghostbusters film, which is fine. It's just, you know, in this day and age, we just get so many reboots and reboot quills and remakes and reboot makes and, you know, plot points that exist solely to 
you know, pay homage to films of yesteryear. You know, they don't add enough new elements. They're just ripping, they're just ripping um, classic plot points from earlier features and putting them in their own narratives. I do have a little bit of a problem with that, but like I said earlier, the fan service I thought was fine as a whole. I didn't have too much of a problem with it. And let's just say that when McKenna Grace does initially find some of the ghost busting equipment, I did get a little, you know, I got a little giddy. You know, I, I kind of started squirming in my seat. You know, it was really cool to see this equipment again. And oh my gosh, when she finds the uniforms, like the classic Ghostbusters uniforms, she pulls an item out of a, one of the, you know, one of the pockets. And not only was it a neat, not only was it a neat callback, but um, yeah, it, it did um, punch me in the gut. It was an emotional gut punch, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> you know, uh, Ghostbusters has been a part of my life since I was six years old. You know, my dad says you guys are full of crap. I saw this with two other people tonight. Uh, one was Thor, who has appeared on this channel many times. She sends her best. She's been a bit busy lately, but she will appear in future videos. The other was uh, my godchild, Jackie, and they both really enjoyed it. And, you know, Thor, she's admitted to being pretty critical of movies, and while she didn't have a ton to say about it afterwards, she did admit that it did appeal to her, you know, as a Ghostbusters fan. It did, um, it did appeal to her, which I think it will. Like I said earlier, guys, I think Ghostbusters Afterlife will make a lot of hardcore fans of this series happy. I did have a lot. I did have a problem with the tone and some of the newer characters, and you know, just the fact that it wasn't very confident to be its own thing, at least not like near the end. But it's definitely worth a watch, and I will say that it's definitely better than the 2016 Ghostbusters. That film has kind of become the Lord of Voldemort of this franchise. It's the film that shall not be named, and I would say it's. On the same level as Ghostbusters 2, Ghostbusters 2 I actually don't dislike that much. I actually think there's some neat content in Ghostbusters 2. But yes, um, Jason Reitman did do a pretty decent job overall. I could tell that he wanted to honor his father's legacy, and that's what this film is all about. You know, honoring your you know family legacy. And I don't want to spoil too much, guys, but let's just say that Harold Ramis does have a bigger the bigger presence than I would have anticipated going into this movie, and yeah. This film was obviously a labor of love for all involved, and I do respect it for that, you know, despite my problems. If I were to grade it out of four stars, I'd probably give it two and a half, but I'm leaning more towards the positive here, guys. It's definitely not a waste of time. I know it's not getting the best of reviews right now, but... If you're a fan of the series, definitely go check it out. I mean, you'll probably have a good time. You'll definitely get something out of the ending, which I certainly did. Some of you might be wondering if other classic Ghostbusters appear. I'm not going to spoil that for you. That's not what I'm about on this channel. I don't do spoiler reviews. I'm just going to say, go see it, and you'll probably have a good time. So yes, guys, those are my overall thoughts on Ghostbusters Afterlife, one of the most highly anticipated movies of 2021. As far as what we have to look forward to the rest of the year, I know this isn't a horror movie, but my god, Spider-Man No Way Home, just, oh my god, every time I think about that movie, I just want to erupt like a volcano. I cannot wait for Spider-Man No Way Home, I'm going to be there opening night. I've actually gotten an invitation from a dear friend of mine to see it um, the day before it comes out, so I might have to take him up on that offer. I'm really excited for that film. But yes, um, guys, thank you so much for joining me in my conversation of Ghostbusters Afterlife. I would love to know what you thought of this movie. Did it uh, please you as Ghostbusters fans? Did you want it to be something else? Um, as far as its overall tone, did it make you feel like you were watching a Ghostbusters movie overall? Or did it feel a little bit too, shall we say, toned down? You know, you know, like I said, if Ghostbusters was National Lampoon, this film is like explorers or the goonies <laughs> anyway guys thank you so much again and yeah busted makes me feel good there's something strange in this neighborhood no there isn't i'm just kidding um we live a pretty uh, basic life we're, we're basic people here in this house but yes thank you so much guys again if you like this go and subscribe to our channel round the clock frice for more horrific content we have more awesome videos planned for you in the future, and as always, stay very scary, boils and ghouls, and have fun busting those ghosts. Stay busty. That sounds very wrong, but have a great night, guys. Take care.